for our evening today. It's the first seminar of the new year, and it really is a great pleasure for me personally to introduce to you Professor Ann Powells, uh, who I, you know, I, I know her from many years ago because I was teaching a course on gender and language in Budapest for about four or five years. And one of her articles on, uh, and uh, I think it's a book as well, on uh, gender and language learning and language use uh, was a very key article for some of my students. And it was a very inspiring article because I was trying to talk about some of the work I was doing on language reform and how uh, one should start avoid using sexist language. And Anne had said a number of things, and she's written an enormous amount. Uh, just to give you a sort of brief idea, uh, uh, she is uh, currently Dean of Faculty of Arts, Humanities and Social Science. Oh no, she's the head of the College of Arts and Law at Birmingham. Uh, she was before in Australia, uh, where she was a Dean of Faculty of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of Western Australia. She was a professor of linguistics there and held many, many senior posts at Monash University, University of New England, Wurundong, if I pronounce it rightly. Uh, and her research actually focuses on the kind of things I'm really, really interested in. Issues with social identity, language, and, and uh, society, and of course culture, which you can't leave out of it. <coughs> She's done really groundbreaking, enormous studies of, of uh, languages and language learning and teaching in Australia, and she's written about other things across the world too, with some very, very uh, amazing researchers. And he has a very long CV, I'm not going to go into the whole CV, at the moment. Uh, from my point of view, I'm very much into, those of you who know my work, I'm very much into the languages of minorities, particularly immigrant and indigenous minorities, wherever they are across the world. And I've been doing a lot of work on community languages over the last uh, few years while I've been at SOAS. And I met Anne a couple of years ago when we came to one of our conferences on community languages. And I was so delighted because, you know, I only knew the name. And actually, not only was I delighted, I was a bit apprehensive when we were talking about some of our work. She knows a lot more than most of us, certainly me, about community languages. So I'm not going to you know, say any, any much more about her work. I think it's best if she says it. And she's going to talk to you today about community languages, sometimes called heritage languages, in higher education. And she's going to talk about uh, the initiatives from Australia. So at least some of them. Thank you and, very and much. It's always embarrassing to hear your own introduction, but I suppose we need to learn to listen gracefully and thankfully for that. Um, um, I just had a brief conversation with one of the people coming tonight, and that alerted me to um, something that Itesh has also pointed out. Um, people are familiar with the term heritage and community, um, because they are indeed, they're the same different names depending on the ge geographical region you work in. So heritage is much more the name for minority languages in Northern America, especially Canada, whereas community languages I think is also more familiar here. I just wanted to make clear in case people didn't know that. Okay, good. So I'd like to do three things tonight. One is I'm going to give you a snapshot of the linguistic diversity in Australia. Um, it's not as diverse as Britain, but then you have, um, or I should say we have, I work here now, um, more than 60 million people, Australia has ba barely 20 million people. So the linguistic diversity is going to be somewhat different. The second thing I will briefly talk about is language policy in Australia, because ultimately uh, you may be as rich in languages as you uh, can be, and I think most parts of the world, I'm always told, Iceland and Port Portugal are the only monolingual countries in the world. I don't think that's true, but anyway. Uh, if you don't have a policy that generates ideas about and, and, and praises or, um, let's say, tolerates multilingualism, then it will disappear more or less within a generation, or even, as you can hear from my accent, even within the first generation. Dutch around the world disappears within the generation that moves to another country. Uh, I think they want to win the prize of quickest assimilation. So, interesting, isn't it? Because they're actually one of the most multilingual uh, groups in Europe. Many Dutch people speak two or three languages, um, which is still um, quite amazing in the European context. So my second part is very briefly something about language policy. The third part 
then deal specifically with universities, what is happening with languages in university, and I will run past you, not in a, in a massive, uh, in a very quick way, but um, I will give you, at the moment, three models that have not been invented in Australia, but that have been fairly well tested in Australia to collaborate between universities in order to maintain 90% of the languages that actually are not seen as popular in typical university terms, meaning they don't break even. I'm sorry, I occasionally use some business-like terms because unfortunately universities have become enterprises and especially I assume many of you have something to do with languages. The two things that always come up is you cost too much and you haven't got enough people. Uh, but you're very important for the institution. Absolutely crucial. Key, key learning outcome, language, but you know, too bad for the two others. So I'm going to talk about three models that have been tested in Australia, not entirely new, but I will give you some clues why they work and why some others that are still in place only work on, and if I'll use then a sexist term, on the gentleman's agreement as such. So that's the sort of uh, organisation of my talk. You can interrupt me at any time. But I wouldn't mind if the chair could give me an indication of how long I can talk. Uh, about Excellent. That's good. Okay, so let, let's start with a little bit around the. Um, uh, this is, I'll just sit down and you can see it slightly better. So, okay. Australia does have a, a census, and the census has a language question. Unfortunately, the language question keeps changing, so comparing from one uh, census to another is difficult. But the last four censuses have had the question, what languages do you speak at home? Um, so on the basis of that, there is no testing in census about what speaking means or what using means, but it's basically there. Well, in fact, 17% of Australians over the age of five say that they speak a language other than English in their home, more or less on a regular basis. That has actually gone up. Uh, so... Um, Initially, it was about 13%, so over 10 years' time, for an entire population to move from 13 to 17% is quite amazing. We then have, and that's probably not comparable to what uh, Britain has, more than 35, uh, 350 languages spoken in Australia. Now, can I say, there's probably more, but the census only allowed for 350 to be processed. Many of these are actually indigenous <coughs> languages. So of the 350, about 160 are languages that have been transported into Australia uh, from around the world. But indigenous languages being Australian Aboriginal languages and to, to some extent Torres Strait Islander lang languages make up the majority, but uh, some of uh, colleagues here at SOAS will also know is most of these languages have communities of less than 20 species. So the focus for that is on a race against the time to record the languages and with some of the bigger <coughs> ones to see to what extent uh, younger people want to learn or relearn the language. Unfortunately, and I apologise in advance, unfortunately I will say very little about Australian languages in higher education for two reasons. One, there is very, very little there. Uh, secondly, it is a more politicised issue in the sense that depending on the university you're at, it is seen as an independent issue, therefore Aboriginal languages are there for Aboriginal people, and that's the group that will teach them and that will learn them. So in some ways people who are not able to either self-identify or being identified by the group as being entitled to access that will not happen. So um, there are actually colleagues here at SOAS who know far more about Australian Aboriginal languages than I do, so I'll, I'll leave that aside. Just briefly then, in terms of those sort of community languages that have come in from uh, outside, at the moment the top ten languages are Chinese. You can see the Chinese. I must say I have done something that linguists should never do, and that is put together the various Chinese dialects. So this contains... Mandarin, Cantonese, Hokkien uh, as the major languages. Italian, Greek, Arabic, Vietnamese, Spanish, 
Tagalog or Filipino. I have that stroke basically because the way in which to, uh, the, um, people on the census self-identified. It worked out that in most cases it was actually Tagalog, but some had said Filipino and not many as a separate language. German, Hindi and Croatian. Um, the, if you look then 30 years ago, it was a very different perspective. Of course that is the result of migration patterns. Um, Italian continues to be a very strong language, um, and Greek too, but most of the others, uh, of the other European languages, have fallen off the bottom, uh, of the top ten languages. Um, one of the most uh, amazing ones is actually German, but it has still a fairly large community in um, Australia, but there's almost no language means. So, the next thing I want to, um, basically, I'm not doing here a lecture on language maintenance, so I'm only picking up those things that are important in looking at what happens with uh, those languages in higher education. What I have uh, set out in the next uh, overhead, however, is those languages that have a very young profile. It says quite clearly there, this is the percentage of speakers that are under the age of 14, uh, meaning the language is spoken by people in that age group. So if you look at languages like Arabic, Vietnamese, Cantonese, Mandarin, Spanish, Greek, and Italian, you can see what percentage of the overall population, population in that group claiming to use the language, what their age profile is. So actually, Arabic and Vietnamese are young languages meaning they have a large group of people who speak the language who are under 14 years of age. So if the importance of that is that if these languages, are, if these students and their parents are interested in language maintenance, these will be the languages that will be of demand from a community sense, not from a security sense, in the community at secondary level, primary, secondary level, and later on at university level. The two languages that, um, Italian has dropped substantially. So there's a very small group of Italian um, second and third generation that still maintains the language. Greek is a language that's been in Australia for a long period of time and is quite strong. But that's the case here in, in, in uh, uh, Britain too, it's the case in America. Greek people really are very language oriented. If we look at the old profile, the number of people over the age of 55 claiming to be a speaker of Latvian is very high. So there are almost no young people speaking Lat Latvian in Australia, Lithuanian, Dutch, Ukrainian, German. So the entire population, sorry, the entire group might still be 200,000 people, but of these 200,000 people, 67% are over the age of 55 they have not passed on the language to the second or third generation, which means that by the time they pass, there will be virtually no demand for that language from a community perspective. And uh, that, I think, is the important one uh, from um, uh, a linguistic angle. So that's sort of the situation we've got in Australia. Now, I've highlighted, and if you want some questions around that, I'm very happy to answer um, clearly there is substantial difference in language maintenance patterns in communities. I've already highlighted Greeks do see language as very important. It doesn't mean that their proficiency in Greek is that high, but they give a very high rating to the importance of having language passed on to the next generation. Uh, just an anecdote, uh, if you talk, I'm, I'm not sure whether there are any uh, Greek speakers here, um, uh, I hope this uh, counts uh, too, but um, my own research on Greek was, especially with second generation, saying, um, what was your most, um, most pleasant and your least pleasant uh, experience to do with the Greek language? And the least pleasant was I had to go to Saturday school doing Greek lessons. Almost, in, in a group of about 500, almost all said that. I then would also ask the question, what would you like to see your children do? And almost all said, they've got to go to Greek school. It's horrible, but you must do it. As a Greek, you've got to go to Greek school. So it is interesting to see. And 
in fact, it is true, the third and the fourth generation still will send their children to Greek school. Uh, that's not the case for Italians. That's not the case for some other groups. The Vietnamese are a very interesting group. They will probably move faster in terms of language shift than initially expected because they are much more willing to move away. Vietnamese does not seem to be that important in their um, ethno-linguistic makeup. Some other groups um, are much more interested. That's another lecture about you know, the, those sorts of things, but I, I did want to point out that there are substantial variations. Let's now look at the language policy issues. Like any country, there have been massive fluctuations in how countries have dealt with, as, uh, as they are called in, in, in the US, aliens um, or migrants or people who settle from outside. Now, um, the person who probably has written most about that in an Australian context will be known to some of you, is Joseph Lobianco. I've got his name there because he was also the architect of the first national policy on languages. But so, in the very early days of, of uh, well, at least white Australia settlements, there was an enormous variety and quite a lot of tolerance. Over the world wars, that tolerance moved from tolerance to actually banning of languages. German was banned for a very long period of time. And depending on how social and political relations worked, you had periods where there was tolerance but no support and other periods, especially around the late 1980s, where it was actually an issue of celebrating the linguistic diversity. It is that moment around the late 1980s that actually partly as a result of pressure groups made up of um, immigrant uh, groups, but especially also language scholars. I, I must say in Australia, language scholars have been very, very active in language policy. Um, so that there is probably, and I, I don't compare with Britain, but there's probably not such an enormous distance between those who research language and those who are actually on the barricades trying, especially applied linguists, are always at the forefront of trying to uh, not only <coughs> help make policy and shape it, but also improve. So around that time, with these particular pressure groups, a particular minister was convinced that it would be in the interest of the government to at least have some form of overview of what is actually happening in Australia. And so initially what was done was a language survey, how many languages are there, what are the needs of, of, of the various groups. And that came to formulation that is known as a national policy of languages with four main principles. Now, I, in my last point I said there have been many reiterations and variations since then, but what has been, what has been maintained is those four principles. So English for all, it started off very clearly that English has to be a language that is spoken by, mo by all people. There was an understanding that um, some people needed to be assisted to be able to learn English rather than um, simply, well, you're in this country, learn English. I make that point because in the 1960s, it was assumed, and those of you who have worked with language, it was assumed that adults needed some learning of language, which usually occurred on the boat with... Um, you know, a little booklet, uh, and that was basically it. However, it was also assumed that children will learn language by pure osmosis. You throw them out into a classroom and they will learn it. Now, in fact, quite a few of them did learn and didn't sink, uh, sw swam quite well. But it was in the uh, 19, late 1980s that it was seen important for the maintenance of bilingualism that actually ch child migrants got proper English classes as well. So English for all is still uh, absolutely um, at the forefront of the principles. Obviously, that has been interpreted over the years, and some of you may have heard of our versions of uh, 
British nationalism, it, it had a name at some stage, the name of a woman, Pauline Hanson, um, Hansenism it was, and that, that was basically, you know, English for all and English army. So obviously that changes, but um, certainly that's there. What has not changed at all either is a second language for all. So it is actually a principle of all policies that there should be encouragement for everyone to have access to a second language. Now, this is the principle. You then have the practice. So in the 1980s and in the 1990s, a lot of money was made available through government programs to basically have incentives for those who did not speak a second language to learn one, and for those who did have a second language through either being a community language um, or an Aboriginal language, just to maintain that. Over time, the funding of that aspect has dramatically changed. At the moment, probably Australia still puts a lot of money in the learning and the maintaining of a second language. However, the political impact has come through which language? If you are, uh, I often like to use Orwell's Animal Farm as an issue for language. All, langu all animals are equal, but some languages, and I'll translate that, are more equal than others, is absolutely clear cut uh, in Australia. So what you have is that um, a number of languages have been identified as so-called priority languages in the country. Now, pragmatically speaking, and even if we are people very much in support of all languages and all languages being equal, you do understand, and I think some schools in uh, London would have that too, if you look at the language background of the students, you might have actually 135 languages sitting there. So for that school to offer 135 languages is absolutely pragmatically. I'll, I'll come back to that. So I think with the second language for all, I must say what is very good about Australia is that it still has not given up on that. And in fact, over the last 20 years, the number of students who have access to the learning of a language has phenomenally increased. So in many states of uh, Australia, because the primary and secondary school system is a state-based system, the university system is a federal one. So the difficulty is that there are a number of states in Australia, so Victoria versus New South Wales versus Queensland, may actually have different um, implementations of a national policy. So the, the first important thing to say is that um, Australia does offer, uh, does work with priority languages. However, initially it was made quite clear that they should not be drawn purely from what are the languages of wider teaching. They should not simply be the languages that are world languages. Can I say that most states did take that very seriously and normally had amongst their, they can sort of formulate about 10 priority languages for the state. Most of them had a fairly uh, good distribution of saying about three or four so-called world languages that had almost no communities in um, Australia. A typical one is French. The French-speaking community in Australia is minute. There is one, but it's fairly minute. Yet French was always a priority language. On the other hand, Chinese, but also Korean, and in some cases Thai, became one of the priority languages, depending on the socio-demographic makeup of a particular state. So some states like, or it isn't actually state, but the northern part of Australia, where most Aboriginal languages uh, and Aboriginal people, uh, languages spoken and, and are also um, most Aboriginal people live, actually did identify one or two Aboriginal languages. That was almost not the case in Tasmania, for example. So uh, I must say states without being, uh, uh, well, without school systems and states without being forced to do so, did choose a fairly good balance between so-called community languages and languages of wider uh, learning teaching. 
Um, I'll, I'll come back to that. But so the, the third principle was the maintenance of Australian indigenous languages, because if they weren't going to maintain in Australia, well, there wasn't anywhere else to maintain them. That one is a highly politicised um, issue. Um, that is basically, the, uh, you know, uh, the subject of another paper. Uh, what I'm saying here is, it, it has to do with um, self um, self management, and some of the self management has worked extremely well, and others hasn't. And currently, Australia is in a situation where it is taking self management away again from Indigenous people, but actually on the advice of some of their um, major leaders. Australia has had, fairly recently, uh, a move from a very conservative government to, if I dare say so, a more Blairite, uh, or early Blairite type government. Um, so <coughs> things will change again. But um, one of the major things that I must say personally, and I think a lot of linguists were very concerned about, they had very good bilingual programs in um, northern Australia, so that all Aboriginal children had the opportunity to learn their own language, but also English. But for some reason or other, it was not seen as appropriate, so the Aboriginal part was dropped, and a much more assimilative um, uh, English language program was put in place on the basis that they couldn't cope with two languages. Um, so I think that's under the third, the fourth principle, again, is still very much in place, but does change over time. That is, you, when you open the telephone directory in Australia, you will find that the, uh, I'm giving that just as an example, will have about 25 languages in the front pages. So there are still services in languages other than English for those migrants that are either very uh, new or there is a high recognition that if you migrated to Australia uh, over the age of 40 and uh, you have tried but you haven't managed to learn English that these services need to be there. So it's the aging part. I should also say, and perhaps some of you know that, Australia has probably the largest telephone interpreter service. So um, it is, the concept is phenomenal. When you sit uh, in a doctor's surgery, you can actually ring up and in most cases, within half an hour, get someone who speaks your language. The not so nice part is that the regulation of that is not yet what it should be. Therefore, you may very well get someone who has very limited qualifications in that language. But at least it is better than having your three-year-old or five-year-old doing the translation for you in uh, a highly inappropriate situation. So that's a language services uh, aspect. So let me briefly talk about the educational aspect of policy in primary and secondary school because that does uh, impact quite substantially on uh, uh, policy. So I've, I've explained the uh, notion of priority language. Um, what Australia has seen over the last 20 years is an increasing commitment to compulsory language studies. But compulsion, trying to make it compulsory without it being a negative aspect. So what states have is that they must provide at least three years of compulsory language learning in every Childs, and that starts from primary right through to secondary. So it may be, I mean, things have changed, but it may be that one state decides that everyone from the age of seven to ten will do three years of language, and that will be the compulsory uh, Another one would be saying the typical one is your two first years of high school will be um, language. What has happened? And largely voluntary is what has happened is that almost all secondary schools in Australia will have three years, um, actually it's three to four years of compulsory language learning. Most now have also some language learning in primary school. 
What hasn't happened yet um, is the two last years making in the classroom. That did exist in Australia until the 1970s, and it was because there was a requirement that uh, in order to go to university, they must do a language. So possibly the reason for language learning at 17 and 18 weren't the right ones, but it meant that in 1970, more than 60% of students ended up with A-levels in a language because they aspired to go to university. Now, have a bit of a shock. Um, you can see what it says there. Approximately 13% of graduating secondary school uh, students take a language. So there's no way that you can ever get it up that much. Um, what has happened in Australia, perhaps more than in Britain, is what has increased is the number of languages that are available for study. So more than, actually at the moment, more than 130 languages can be studied in primary and secondary school around Australia. Um, I'll talk about the School of Languages in a minute. Um, but what is absolutely amazing, I'd like to keep that in mind for what I'm talking about at universities, you can do your A-levels in more than 40 languages. So um, you have students who can study, uh, and I'll say how, but you can study 12 years of language and you can do your A-levels in Turkish, for example. You can do your A-levels in Latvia. The restriction at the moment is that if four years in the running they have less than five students, then the language may no longer be offered at A level. Now, how do you overcome the, uh, the issue of you cannot teach 130 languages in the same school? Well, what Australia has developed is schools of languages. So, what that is Every state bar one has these. It is, the con it is virtual, but is also real. So what it actually is, it's physically normal day schools who open up their rooms at night or on a Saturday morning, and students come there to do their language components. So, for example, there is no day school that teaches Hindi but you can do Hindi for A-levels in five states. How is it done? You can go, and this is a government school, so you can do part of your A-levels after hours or on Saturday morning by fully qualified government school teachers. The only thing is you don't do it during the day. That has made an enormous difference in these languages. The major difficulty is that if you live in the country part of Australia, 500 miles from a uh, major capital city, you can still do it but not in every language because there is not as yet the materials for pure satellite. But most of Australia's population lives in four or five capital cities, so actually most students don't have to travel or five miles to go to one of these centers. That, I think, has meant an enormous difference. The good thing about this, now I, I, I want to stress this, because there is then an, a whole other industry, often very good, of ethnic schools. These are the schools that are run by the ethnic communities themselves. Until recently, their teachers had no qualifications whatsoever. However, in Australia now, for them to operate, you must have some qualifications. And this is where I indicated in terms of settled. It is the equivalent of a center like you have set up that has provided over the last five to 10 years some training so that a native speaker of a particular language can go into these schools and actually are seen to have the pedagogical skills to teach a language. They're not language teachers, but they can teach that language in the ethnic. The main thing, however, is you have an entire government system completely funded by the government. The students pay something like 20 pounds a year, and that's for materials. But going to these Saturday schools does not cost any money, and you can do the A levels. Uh, so that's the current situation. Now, I, I should say, I mean, having been here for just over two years, is that 
When you talk to Australians, you will hear that they basically complain about the disastrous state of languages in schools. It isn't as good as it should, as it could be, but I think it is much better. You know, to be able to, in fact, choose um, your language. Can I also say is there is no ethnic restriction. So, uh, if you want to study Hindi, but you have absolutely no background. Uh, culturally or ethnically with Hindi, you can do so and you will be catered for. So it is this issue of that it is assumed that most people of a particular background will choose that language or their parents want to choose the language. But if you decide that you want to learn Farsi and you've got nothing to do with Farsi, there is no restriction whatsoever. So let's come now to the university situation. This is, this is the issue that we are facing in Australia and I think increasingly in Britain. Now, the, the big difference is that, I, I may be completely wrong, but the, uh, let's say the, the variety of languages that you can do up to A-level is much smaller than in Australia. But so we've got 40 languages in Australia that are being studied by students. However, in 2006, and it's actually gone down unfortunately, we did a, a survey and only 29 languages were taught in one way or another at university. Of these 29, only 20 actually could be done for a degree. So you could do one year of Cantonese, but that was all. You could not do a degree in Cantonese. In the mid-1990s, about 66 languages were offered. And so within... Ten years' time, it has been reduced to 29. The major reason being, no money, too small uh, a group. Let's let another university do it. We'll get out. But every university said that. So we have a situation of being so multilingual, having, and I'll come back to that, having a larger proportion of domestic students, so home students, not international students, coming to university with a language and actually not being able to study that language. So the top languages in uh, Australian universities are Japanese, Chinese, and in this case Mandarin, French, Italian, Indonesian, German, and Spanish. They are very widely available in Australian universities. Um, but, uh, and I, I can give you some figures, uh, there are 37 <coughs> universities in Australia. Uh, Japanese is available in 32 universities, Chinese in 26, French in 23, Italian in 21, Indonesian in 20, German 18, Spanish in 17. But, so these are, that's about seven languages. Most universities don't teach more than six, and usually three of the top Asian languages and three of the top European languages. So in each Japanese, Japanese, Chinese, and Indonesian, you will find in most universities. And you will probably find French, Spanish, and either Italian or German in universities. Um, really, the less widely taught languages are only available in a very, very small uh, number of universities. Hebrew and these languages are usually only so that's the situation we get. Very briefly, this is the population that is coming to Australia. Uh, domestic students, these are the top languages. 18% have a speaker language of the uh, tongue. More than 120 languages spoken, and yet very few actually can study these languages. Okay, so what we've got as a situation is drastic reduction one language available across the country, none of the others, and a workforce that is very casual. So what we did, uh, okay, let's go. what we've done, and this is not only language scholars, but very much, I must say, it was deans of arts that were looking at that. How can we maintain at least more than 30 languages, or how can we maintain the 30 languages? in a situation where most vice chancellors have said we won't, we won't continue with the language if you don't have 120 students in first year and you don't have about 30, 40 students graduating. In fact, more than seven languages, uh, the seven languages do that. So, 
we developed a project which received a lot of funding, about, um, well, in about half a million um, uh, pounds just for a project, um, to try and strengthen languages through collaborative arrangements. So these were the reasons. Very briefly, I just want to touch upon these. Uh, it, it basically is two models, and then the, the last, so I would like to talk briefly about the collaborative, cooperative blended model. The cooperative blended exchange model is, is identical. The, blend, the online and immersion one, too, I mean, I, I'll say why they're identical slightly different. The last one is one that is widely used in Australian cities and is an absolute disaster, but it, it continues. So that's the one that I did want to say a few words, if I may, about the, that one. Okay, so. so remember, the main thing is that you have situations where universities can no longer sustain the language. Of course, they'll always teach out the language. But what can we do? In Australia, students don't move much around the country. Also, you probably, if you absolutely want to do a language, and it's only taught at this university, but you don't get the entry requirements that that, that university said, you can't actually access the language because it won't let you into the university. So the whole issue was, how can we bring languages together? The first one is a cooperative blended model, and I'll just briefly read that so it, it uh, goes slightly faster. So the main features of the model are the balanced combination of an online curriculum and face-to-face on-site tutoring. In other words, students in all participating universities, so the students stay in their own university, they do not move to the other university. Students in all participating universities have access to the same curriculum and modes of delivery. Their language course is made up of regular online learning and weekly local on-site classes and tutorials. There is a lead university, and the lead university sets the curriculum, it provides the learning materials, it undertakes the assessment, and it hires the staff, including the staff who work at the other university. The lead university is usually a university with the capacity to teach the language and willing to share its curriculum with other universities who are unable to provide the necessary resources. The non-lead participating universities take responsibility for the enrollment of students, they receive the fees of the students, they provide the IT, the library and the space facilities, and house the local staff. Now, the important thing, I know this is the boring part, but this is why it works, is the university enters into an agreement about fee splitting. Usually, the, fee, the lead university gets 60 to 65% of the fee. And agreements last between three and five years. This model has proved extremely successful, especially uh, for universities wishing to drop out of a language that is still present in another language, but more universities willing to introduce a new language, but not having the capacity to do so. So this is a model that is probably working very well for five to ten years. After that, universities decide whether or not they continue with the language or not. But that model has worked for very, uh, very well, mainly because of the financial agreement. Also, remember the students stay in your own university. The cooperative blended exchange model is basically the same one, but in this case, rather than having one lead universities, you have universities exchanging languages. At the moment, we have... So the, the mode of learning is the same, but in fact what we currently have is one university saying, we would like to introduce Arabic, and another university is saying, well, actually, we would like to have Vietnamese. And they exchange. So, in fact, University X has Vietnamese, but a small Vietnamese group, and is interested in getting Arabic in, and vice versa. So, in fact, there is no exchange of fees here, provided the numbers are basically the same. Again, that is a model that has worked very well. 
I can go in, in questions about copyright issues and so on, but I won't bore you with that. That one is working very well. The main issue here is that if you have a very, uh, for two small languages, it works very well. If one wants to introduce Spanish, which is a very popular language, and the other one wants to do a, a not so popular language, say Polish, it's not going to work because the numbers are different. So that works very well. A model that we are currently testing that is very exciting and many uh, very small languages like it, but it hasn't received that much support, is actually what is called a blended online and immersion model. I'll give you the example. Hebrew is almost not available in Australian universities. There's only one that has a tiny little bit. Yet, the demand for Hebrew in different universities is not large hundreds, otherwise they would introduce it, but you usually have about 10 to 15 students wanting to do Hebrew. At the moment, they have no opportunity to learn except by moving to that university, and I have explained the difficulty. So that model involves uh, an online component and two or three intensive immersion settings, that is residential schools, in which they practice the language. We are currently testing it for high-level uh, German because uh, German is too small in too many um, universities, and it's working there. However, it really has been set up for the very small languages. A model that is a variation of that is working at the moment, and that is where the immersion aspect occurs outside of Australia. We are currently doing that with Indonesian, because despite the fact that Indonesian is very widely available in Australia, most Indonesian departments have two staff members. So when one staff member goes on leave, the other one, which is usually, <laughs> you know, they rotate, which means another one has to provide all the classes for four years in Australia, for four years of teaching. It's impossible. So what these groups have done is four or five universities with two staff members come together, share their curriculum, partly online, but then organize a intensive um, <coughs> residential school somewhere in Indonesia. Now, for, for, for Australia, that's a fairly easy one, where the students get, in fact, the same uh, amount of in, uh, language learning in six weeks as if they had it for an entire year. So that's a model that works very well for the Indonesian one. We haven't been able to do it for very small languages yet. That's where I'd like to stop. The model that I'm quite happy to talk about, which is currently a disastrous one, is the city-based model. But if you want to know more